Turquoise is fun because they all look different. You get the cool patterns, variety of shades, and you have all sorts of different lusters. Got a lot of turquoise there. I love it. It's like turquoise ASMR. <laughs> Hey everyone, we're back with another gemologist versus geologist episode. This is Brittany, our in-house geologist, and she has a surprise for me under this sheet. We're gonna start out with something big. I love it. Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness, did you carry this all the way over by um, yourself? I may have had some help. <laughs> it's very heavy. I know that this is turquoise yes, by the look of it, but tell me about this piece. This lovely large specimen comes from China. The matrix that is on this turquoise, so that's gonna be typically black to dark browns, is known as spider web matrix. Most of the time when turquoise forms, it's going to have some sort of matrix with it. There's so many like different patterns that can come from turquoise forming. There's even some like specific kinds like spider web turquoise. This one definitely has a lot of matrix. How most turquoise forms is that it's kind of like like a secondary formation that comes from the combination of water, copper, and aluminum and phosphates that are in the ground. And let's talk about the color. The color is really vibrant. So you have like these really bright spots. You have more of like a robin's egg turquoise and then you have some of the green. Yeah, so the copper is what gives it this nice vibrant blue. Iron contributes to the greens, and then sometimes it can also be altered by zinc. The pattern is super cool. Oh, it's a absolutely. really nice display piece. Turquoise is a hydrous phosphate of copper and aluminum. The way that it forms is in matrix. It's from evaporated deposits. So that's why you get the cool patterns. And when you do get a pure blue or green without any matrix, it makes it really special. I have several more boxes of turquoise that we're gonna look at today. Perfect. Let's get started. This is our first box for you. Ooh, lots of different types of turquoise. Ah, oh, that is cool. I like that this shows the array of colors that turquoise can come in. Turquoise has been around for millennia. And if you go back to ancient writings from across the globe, you can see that concurrently different cultures in different continents had discovered turquoise, wrote about turquoise, used turquoise for ornamental and jewelry purposes. I love to see how people have identified all over the world the innate value of a gem or mineral without you know, having discussed it. I think that's really cool. So turquoise forms in arid climates. And that's from rain being introduced into the ground along with copper, phosphates, and aluminum. Now, imagine way back when you're in this area and most of the color you're going to see is like a sandy brown. And if I walking along and I see this blue color out of nowhere, I would be so interested and intrigued to be like, what is going on here? So I noticed that this one is actually from Virginia, which I find interesting because the turquoise is typically formed in arid climates like mm -hmm. deserts. We know that it forms in the U.S., primarily in the southwestern U.S., mm -hmm. Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona. So tell me about that. Virginia actually has like a very, very small area where it is kind of like arid slash desertous. Huh. In that very small region, you can get bits of turquoise. A lot of turquoise is found as a byproduct of copper mining. The miners will be mining for copper and then they may see a seam or a, a patch of turquoise. If it's viable, meaning it's a high enough quantity or quality, then typically people who are used to mining turquoise will come in, retrieve the turquoise, and then they'll resume copper mining. So I think we should compare contrast some of these specimens on the table because even in my hand from this little jar which again is adorable you have that more like brighter blue you have the greenish blue mm -hmm. you have like the seafoam green and you have all sorts of different lusters so like the one That's that you're true. holding these little nuggets this has a really Mm -hmm. smooth luster, kind of waxy, but like this piece is a duller luster. Yeah, turquoise has 
a decent hardness, but as far as its toughness goes, as time goes on with weathering in general, turquoise has the tendency to just dull. But even so, pieces like these are very beautiful. Got a lot of turquoise there. I love it. It's like turquoise ASMR. <laughs> Are you ready for the next box, Rebecca? I'm always ready. Awesome. Here you go. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, lots of turquoise jewelry. Okay, I'll put it on. Love it. These different pieces of jewelry are really fun because they show the variety that turquoise has. So we've talked a little bit about how turquoise is formed. We haven't mentioned yet that it's quite porous. It takes dye fairly easily, so dyeing is a common treatment for turquoise. Purple turquoise is actually quite common as a dyed color. Turquoise has a variety of shades, so when you subject it to a dye like purple, you still get shades of purple. I like these pieces because they have a lot of depth to it. So you have like a maroon, you have a light lilac, you have a pinker purple. It's not just like one purple color. No, it's not you just have one variety. purple. This ring is really fun. It shows obviously that greenish color. This is not dyed actually, but it has been stabilized, which is a treatment that precludes it from being more porous. And so often you have wax or resins that are incorporated into the turquoise so that they're more stable against things like perfumes or makeup or hairspray or anything that could get into the stone and affect its durability or stability. It's also a very common treatment. The necklace that Brittany has on is really pretty. That has that really nice, vibrant blue. That's from a famous turquoise mine in Arizona called the Sleeping Beauty. It's famous for having that bright, vibrant blue and for not having a ton of matrix on it. That's what makes that really special. So that color is an all natural color, but it has undergone a very interesting treatment called the Zachary process. GIA recognizes this as the only natural treatment for turquoise. And so the Zachary process is actually a little bit of a secret, but what we do know is that the turquoise is soaked in a non-toxic material. It does incorporate that solution into its chemical structure and it allows it to be less porous and more durable for everyday wear. These little leaves are really fun. These are great examples of ornamental material. So turquoise is about a five to six on the most scale of hardness. And so it's really good for carving. It has been used again for millennia to create really special visual pieces. Turquoise, whether, you know, it's being carved or put in jewelry or even <laughs> really big pieces like this one. I would say its main use is really for adornment. There's really not a lot you can do with turquoise mineralogically. Sure, it's an alteration of copper, but you're not really gonna get a lot of material use out of turquoise. From a market perspective, you know, we see a lot of gems come in and out of popularity. Their popularity ebbs and flows depending on different finds or different colors that are popular. Mm -hmm. Turquoise is interesting because it has maintained a pretty stable level of popularity, particularly in the last century. It was designated as a December birthstone in 1912. It really has kind of held its own in the market for a really long time different cultures at different times around the world. They all saw it and they were like, this is so unique. It's been found in burial tombs in ancient Egypt. These different cultures just wanted this turquoise for its beauty, not really for its material use, but just for how lovely it looks. And I think that is amazing. We just have one more box. Okay. Here you go. Oh, look at that botryoidal. Botryl to growth is pretty nice. Yeah. Nice. Cool. I'm going to take an educated guess and say these are not turquoise pieces. They are not turquoise pieces. Each piece kind of symbolizes a different piece of information. This piece, or at least the green botryodal growth that is on here, is known as clanorite. 
turquoise is its own group of minerals, a total of five, including turquoise, and one of them is planarite. Why it has a group of its own is that the chemical formula for turquoise, it can be a little iffy at times just because of the porosity. It can alter ever so slightly when other elements can incorporate into the chemical composition. These minerals can be mistaken for turquoise. It's also just really cute with the it's little so watery cute. little growth and a little bit of green. So I just really wanted to show you that. Yeah, I love that. This next piece you'll probably be a little bit more familiar with is howlite. Oh, howlite is not related to turquoise whatsoever. It is a different mineral entirely, but it is one that is often dyed to imitate turquoise. Both are porous stones that take dye really easily and with howlite, there's like this black veining which doesn't really dye as much and so it kind of resembles a little bit of the matrix that you can see within turquoise and it's just a common imitator. Yeah, a lot of the quote turquoise on the market is dyed howlite and you know, let us know if you want us to do an episode all about turquoise and its simulants and synthetics because being able to separate those is actually quite tricky. I think it is time to do a closer look. Well, as the gemologist component of this episode, I feel that it would be the expected thing to choose your necklace. I totally forgot I was wearing this. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but I'm not going to because I just love this little guy. Oh, the jar. Um, the oh. jar of rough. It shows many different varieties of colors, mm -hmm. of polishes and yep. lusters. And so I'm gonna choose this one. It is very cute. As the geologist of the episode, of course, I would love to do the giant piece of turquoise that is on this table, but it's kind of too big to choose. So it's gonna be this planarite. I feel like you guys have probably seen a good bit of turquoise over the years, but I don't think you guys have really come across this one. So I think taking a closer look at this planarite would be very nice. Brittany, thank you so much for showing me all of these different pieces. It's always fun to talk about the gemology and geology of different materials. Let us know if you want to see more Gemologist First Geologist episodes. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that bell so you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Thanks for watching.